Hello, Queensland Storyteller time again. I'm Kim Dodsworth. Today's story is called The Two Inns. It was written by Alphonse Daudet, 1840-1897. Daudet was born at Nîmes and Provence in the south of France. He's chiefly remembered for Letters from My Windmill, Lèche de Montmoulin, a series of tales based on Provencal life and from which today's story is drawn. Nowadays, Daudet is largely forgotten, but between 1875 and 1890, he was regarded as the most successful novelist in France. The Two Inns by Alphonse Daudet It was while returning from Nîmes, one July afternoon. The weather was oppressively hot. As far as I could see, clouds of dust hung over the burning white road between the gardens of olive trees and a few dwarf oak trees, under a huge sun of dullish silver which filled the whole sky. Not a patch of shade, not a breath of wind, nothing but the quivering of the hot air and the strident cry of the cicadas, that crazy, deafening, urgent music whose loudness seemed the equivalent in sound of this immense, quivering radiance. I had been walking for two hours without seeing a soul, when suddenly a cluster of white houses rose up in front of me through the dust of the road. They were what is called the posting station of St. Vincent, Five or six small farmhouses, a few long red-roofed barns, a drinking trough without water under a clump of lean fig trees, and beyond them all, two large inns facing each other on either side of the road. The proximity of these inns was somewhat startling. On one side, a large new building, full of life and movement, all its doors open, the coach drawn up in front, the steaming horses being unharnessed, the passengers having a quick drink on the roadside in the narrow shade of the walls, its yard a jumble of mules and carts, carriers lying under the sheds, waiting the cool of the evening. Inside, shouts, curses, banging of fists on tables, clatter of glasses, click of billiards, popping of lemonade corks, and, overriding all this uproar, a voice singing, loudly, joyously, making all the windows shake. Plaisir d'amour ne dure qu'un moment, chagrin d'amour Dura toute la vie. The inn opposite was, in contrast, silent and apparently deserted. Grass in the gateway, shutters broken, on the door a mildewed holly bough hanging like a reminder of glory departed, the doorsteps wedged with stones from the road. Everything so poor, so pitiful, that it truly would be an act of charity to stop and have a drink there. On entering, I found a long, drab, empty room, which the dazzling light through the three large uncurtained windows made still more empty and drab. Even the furniture seemed asleep. Some rickety tables on which stood a few dusty glasses, a billiard table holding out its torn pockets as if they were beggars' bowls, a yellow sofa, an old counter, and flies. Flies! I have never seen so many. On the ceiling, sticking to the window panes, on the glasses, whole clusters of them. When I opened the door, it caused a buzzing, a whirling of wings as if I'd entered a hive. At the back of the room, in the recess of a casement window, there was a woman standing, completely absorbed in what she was looking at outside. I called to her twice. Hey there, mistress! She turned slowly, so that I was able to take in her poor peasant woman's face, lined, wrinkled, the colour of earth, encircled by long pinners of reddish-brown lace, such as our old women wear. Yet this was not an old woman. Rather, she was one who had known sorrow too soon and too deeply. What is it you want? she asked, wiping her eyes. To sit a moment and drink something. She gave me a look, full of astonishment, without moving from the window, as if she did not understand. This isn't an inn, then? The woman sighed. Yes, you can call it an inn, if you like. 
but why don't you go over there like the others? It's much more lively. Too lively for me. I'd rather stay here. And without waiting for an answer, I seated myself at a table. When she was quite sure I was speaking seriously, she began to move about with a very busy air, opening drawers, moving bottles, wiping glasses, disturbing the flies. It made one feel that a customer was quite an event. Now and then the poor woman stopped and held her head as if she despaired of doing what she had to do. Then she went off into the room at the back. I heard her rattling large keys, struggling with locks, rummaging in the bread bin, blowing, dusting, washing plates. From time to time there came a long, drawn-out sigh, a half-smothered sob. After a quarter of an hour of these goings-on, I had before me a plate of raisins, an old bokeh loaf as hard as grit, and a bottle of inferior local wine. You are served, said the strange creature, and returned quickly to her place at the window. While I drank, I tried to make her talk. You don't often have people here, do you? No, monsieur, never a soul. When we were on our own here, it was different. Then we had the posting station, meals during the duck shooting season, carriages stopping all the year round. But since the people over the way came, we've lost everything. Everybody prefers to go there. It's too dull for them here. It's no use pretending it isn't. I've lost all my looks. I keep having feverish attacks since my two little girls died. Over there it's just the opposite. Everybody always laughing and joking. A woman from Al runs it, a real beauty, with lace and gold round her neck. The coach driver's her lover, so he stops the coach there now. And all the chambermaids are the coaxing come hither sort. That helps to bring the money in as well. She gets all the young fellows from Besance, Redessin, Jean Pierre. The carriers go out of their way just to call, now she's there. And I, I'm stuck here all day, without a soul, breaking my heart. She said all this in an apathetic voice, her forehead still pressed against the window pane. Obviously, there was something about the inn opposite, preying very much on her mind. All at once, on the other side of the road, there was a great commotion. The coach was moving off in a cloud of dust. Whips could be heard cracking. A fanfare of the postillion's horn, girls shouting as they ran to the door, Goodbye! Goodbye! And above it all, that same tremendous voice ringing out more beautifully than before. Plaisir d'amour ne dure qu'un moment, chagrin d'amour dure toute la vie. At the sound of this voice, my hostess shivered from head to foot, and turning to me, said in a low voice, Do you hear? That's my husband. He does sing well, doesn't he? I looked at her, dumbfounded. What? Your husband? He goes over there also? Then, heartbrokenly, but with a great gentleness, What can you expect, monsieur? That is how men are. They don't like tears, and I am always weeping since my little ones died. And it's so sad. This big house, where there's never a soul. So when he gets too bored, my poor Ose goes and has a drink over there. And he's such a wonderful voice, the woman from Al makes him sing. Listen, there he's beginning again. And trembling, with her hands raised, and with huge tears making her still uglier, she stood there at the window as if in an ecstatic trance, listening to her Ose singing for the woman from Al. J'ai tout quitté pour l'ingrata Sylvie, elle me quitte et prendre un autre amant. Plaisir d'amour. Ne dure qu'un moment, chagrin d'amour dure toute la vie. And that story was The Two Inns by Alphonse Daudet, 1840 to 1897. I'll be back again this time next week with another short story of quality. 
I'm Kim Dodsworth. I hope you'll join me.